Good morning and welcome to this briefing organised by the family of Daphne Caruana Galizia. My name is Tony Murphy of Bat Murphy, the family's solicitor. Daphne was a brilliant, fearless journalist who was assassinated in the prime of her life for simply doing her job. She was also a much loved daughter, granddaughter, sister, aunt, niece, wife, and the mother of three remarkable sons, the youngest of whom, Paul, joins us today. In seeking justice for Daphne, her family have always been clear that one must look beyond the boundaries of individual criminal culpability and to examine the systemic failure of state accountability in Malta, which caused the culture of impunity responsible for the loss of Daphne's life at just 53 years of age. This is why, in addition to calling for the full force of the criminal law to be brought to bear on the masterminds and alleged foot soldiers of Daphne's assassination, her family have also always called for a full independent public inquiry to examine the wider state failures. That request was made in the aftermath of Daphne's assassination in 2017 and was flatly rejected by the Maltese government. This required the family, while still in the fog of grief, to marshal an international team of lawyers, activists and politicians to press the call for a public inquiry, with the government only relenting two years later under threat of legal proceedings and in the face of international opprobrium. That public inquiry has now issued its report, which is why we're here today to discuss its findings with our distinguished panel. But before I introduce you to our speakers, I wanted to draw attention to just one of the many powerful failings identified by this inquiry, which I will now read out. The state must bear responsibility for the assassination because it created an atmosphere of impunity generated from the highest levels in the heart of the administration within the office of the prime minister that like an octopus spread to other entities such as regulatory institutions and the police, leading to the collapse of the rule of law. With those sobering words and with that clarion call for change by the inquiry, I now turn to introduce you to our speakers for today. It means a great deal to us to be joined by Daphne's son, Paul Caruana Galizia, a respected journalist, academic and author, whom together with the other members of his formidable family, has led the search for the truth surrounding the loss of his mother's life. You will then hear from the family's renowned Maltese lawyer, Therese Comedini Kakia, who together with Jason Azapadi and her team of lawyers has been at the forefront of the family's fight for justice in Malta, both in representing their interests in the public inquiry and the ongoing criminal proceedings. Therese is one of Europe's foremost human rights lawyers, a member of parliament in Malta and a former member of the European Parliament. Our third speaker is Keelan Gallagher, QC of Doughty Street Chambers, who leads the family's international team. Keelan is an award-winning and groundbreaking lawyer whose many skills include representing journalists in peril around the world. We are very fortunate to have as our fourth and final speaker, Rebecca Vincent, Director of International Campaigns at Reporters Without Borders, who has been instrumental in leading civil society's response to this tragedy. All three of these amazing women have stood with the family and traveled with them on their journey over the past four years. So it's important and fitting that they are here with Paul today as he and his family arrive at this important milestone, a milestone hewn out of the courage, fortitude and integrity of the Corona Galizia family. I will shortly hand over to Paul, but before I do, may I mention two matters of housekeeping. First, there'll be a Q&A at the very end of all four speakers. So if you have a question or comment, please include it in the Q&A facilities and I'll discuss it with the speakers at the end. And finally, we're all obviously conscious of the, that related criminal proceedings are ongoing, such that I will ensure that questions or comments put do not pose any risk to the integrity of those proceedings. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Paul. Thank you, Tony, for those incredibly kind words. Um, I think like you, if I may, I want to start um, by acknowledging the significance of this report 
And it feels unbelievable in this moment to think that almost four years ago, my family didn't even know to call for a public inquiry, mainly because Malta had never had one. And it's it's thanks to um, thanks to our really exceptional team of lawyers that Tony introduced. But I think I should mention again: so Therese, Jason, Eve, Tony, Keelan, Jonathan, and Jen, activists in Malta and around the world that we managed to get here. And you know, part of why I wanted to list all these people is to show what it took. You know, it took seven of the best lawyers out there, two years of unrelenting campaigning and to get what was Malta's by right. Uh, so when we received the report yesterday, we're totally overwhelmed. Um, emotionally and in every way and in a way I don't know why because it, it confirmed what we had long suspected that the state must bear responsibility for my mother's murder and that she should still be alive and I you know those words keep ringing in my ears that she should still be alive and it's a it's a real list of failings that led to her, to her murder. Um, and the report is obviously groundbreaking in, in many other ways. So one of its findings, for example, is that a government sponsored dehumanization campaign of my mother prepared the ground for her assassination. And I think that struck us so much, first, because it's a really a really important step forward that in Malta we're finally recognizing the serious physical harm posed by political propaganda and also because it restores her humanity to say that she was subjected to this vicious dehumanization campaign and then she was killed. The report also shows how senior government officials um, participated in an attempted cover-up of her murder and it finds that the risks to her life were obvious to everyone in the country except apparently the authorities entrusted with protecting her life so like tony said it is important to us that the conclusions of this really landmark report are implemented in full and in a non-partisan way and our lawyers can talk a bit more about how that can be done during this call. But I, um, I also want to say, um, to close, that we acknowledge the Prime Minister's apology that he made in Parliament this morning, and that we agree with him completely that that apology is owed to Malta and not just us. So thank you, everyone who's campaigned for this moment and for attending this call. Thank you, Paul. It's difficult to imagine how painful the last four years have been for you and your family. You have done Daphne, Malta and the world a great service by your insistence on the truth. And we, we salute you for that and, and thank you. You will now hear from Therese Komadini Kakia, who, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the, the lead for the family's team of lawyers in Malta. And she's joined today by her co counsel Jason Azapadi, who is also a key member of the team and also a member of the Maltese Parliament. Therese, thank you. Thank you, Tony. And uh, thank you, everyone, for really being here and for your continued interest in this, uh, in this fight for justice for Daphne. It's been a fight for justice for Daphne, but it has also been a fight for justice for all journalists alike. And what I will try and do um, is I'll try and indicate the lines of inquiry, some general conclusions that were reached by the board, some recommendations that the board has also given, but I'd also like to share with you some takeaway points that 
have really uh, affected me and which are found in this report. And most of all, I would also like to see a way forward. As Paul said, this report deserves a real clear way forward for its implementation. I would say the main general takeaway points for me from this report are the following. One, that Daphne's assassination pulled Malta back from becoming an entrenched mafia state. It had to be the assassination of a brave journalist to stop this country from becoming an entrenched mafia state. The report also recognizes that Daphne was assassinated as a consequence of that impunity generated by the state and that that impunity was generated for a restricted network of persons and that that network was made up of politicians, businessmen and criminals. Another takeaway for me for, for, from this report is that Daphne was assassinated for her investigative work, work about the illicit intricacies between big business and, politi and politics. And I think this was a major thing that gives some comfort to the family, but also some comfort to those who have um, tried to support the cause for justice for Daphne. We now have we now have it written black on white that Daphne was saying the truth, that Daphne deserved to be treated much better. The report, another takeaway point for me is that Daphne was vilified, harassed and dehumanized as a journalist and that this was being done by the highest echelons of government and that this was being done only because she was doing her job as a journalist. So while the report has many, many recommendations and includes and encompasses a lot of recommendations that were presented to the public inquiry, even by NGOs and members of civil society, I think what I really expect from the multi-state at this point is that it studies this report well and that it considers all the recommendations made, but that such consideration must be made in a non-partisan manner. I would like Malta to stand united in a process of reconciliation, which in my opinion can only be achieved with Parliament appointing a truly independent and impartial committee of experts in which journalists participate on an equal footing so that this committee may then study with journalists which reforms are necessary and needed immediately in the medium term and in the long term. I would really like, and I think we would really like these recommendations and the recommendations of that committee of experts to be then adopted through parliament. This is not exactly what the prime minister promised this morning. We, and I, I, this is a strong opinion of mine. I would like the reforms to be completely independent, impartial and non-partisan. This is the way to start a process of reconciliation. And this is the only way we can make sure that journalists are efficiently, but also effectively protected. So if I had to say, where should we start from immediately? I think we should all stop political rhetoric, which denigrates journalists and try to foster an environment which is deserving of the fourth pillar of democracy. What we really expect now is that Daphne's assassination not be in vain, that journalists in Malta and around the world become better protected from the lessons learned in this inquiry, that the pain of Daphne's family and the struggle of Malta to establish an environment which is free from harassment, threats and violence for journalists can benefit others elsewhere too. In general, the Board of Inquiry was asked to follow three lines of investigation. For each line of inquiry, the Board has concluded that there is state responsibility and that state action needs to be taken without further delay. 
the first line of inquiry asked, what, was there any wrongful action or omission by or within any state entity facili which facilitated the assassination or failed to prevent it? The answer of the board is yes, there was. This happened because the state orchestrated a plan to neutralize the investigative work of a journalist, a plan which was centrally organized by the office of the prime minister. Because of this, the board concluded that the state must shoulder the responsibility for Daphne's assassination, because it, it itself created an atmosphere of impunity, and this impunity was generated by its highest echelons. But the board also concluded that this state of impunity brought about a collapse of the rule of law. And to me, that is an important conclusion because it really and truly highlights the importance of protecting journalists in any democratic society. The state, the board said, also failed to fulfill its positive obligations to protect Daphne's life from risks, risks which it ought to have known she was exposed to, and risks which the state itself had expanded and increased dramatically. The second line of inquiry asked, are there effective criminal provisions or other practical means to avoid the development of a de facto state of impunity? The board's reply, was partially. That is, according to the board, the current legislation addresses normal circumstances which could lead to a de facto state of impunity. But the current legislation could not prevent the exceptional situation which the board identified. An exceptional situation which can be described as a silent coup a silent state capture of state institutions. So the board has concluded that even where there is legislation, its execution was tarnished with that impunity which was generated by the state. That laws were manipulated or even avoided with the purpose of allowing business motivated by personal gain to take precedence and to supersede the basic rule of good governance. Unfortunately, the board concluded, the few measures taken by government to address shortcomings came about only because of Daphne's assassination. It was the assassination of a journalist that made those reforms more urgent, but not that no one could foresee that those reforms were needed. The third line of inquiry asked, did the state fulfill its positive obligation to take preventive operational measures to protect individuals whose lives are at risk from criminal acts and in particular in case of journalists? And the clear answer of the board to this is that no, the state actually failed to fulfill its positive obligation to take preventive operational measures to protect the life of Daphne Caruana Galizia. But what is even more astounding is that the board concluded that the state aggravated the risk to Daphne's life with its own continued campaign to dehumanize her. A campaign which was orchestrated by members of government itself. A campaign which was vociferous and which exposed Daphne as it's the government's own opposition. The inquiry also concludes that state entities such as the police were strangely not aware of the grave and imminent risks to which Daphne was exposed, even though they should have been so aware. And because of these conclusions, the board has come up with and has made a number of recommendations, each one of them equally deserving of being analyzed and considered. I will only mention a few which deal with the protection of journalists and journalism. The board has asked Malta to provide legislative recognition of the role of journalists 
as a fundamental pillar of our democracy. A legislative reform, which should include even constitutional recognition of the role of journalists in our democracy. The board has also proposed that Malta establishes or appoints an ombudsman or a commissioner responsible for ethical journalism. But more importantly, and most um, down to earth, I would say, is that the board has insisted and declared that it is only the timely investigation of allegations of crime and of illicit behavior as is exposed by investigative journalism that can truly protect journalists. And that it is this, it is the effort of all state entities to believe journalists, to trust journalists, to stop treating journalists as their enemies, that will be the best protection for journalists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Therese. And I'd like to echo Paul's thanks to you, Jason and Ava, uh, on behalf of the family. It's been humbling for the international team in London to witness how the Maltese team has dealt with the unrelenting pressure at the coalface with the family, dealing with a slew of proceedings in, it seems like, every jurisdiction so effectively. It's been such a privilege to work alongside you on behalf of the family. For anyone who's joined us more recently, I just wanted to remind you that we will be having a Q&A at the end of all four speakers, and we've already had some questions and answers, and for any of you who may have to leave before the end of the session, I assure you we will put those questions and we'll see if there's a way of getting the answers to you if you've told us that you're leaving. But there's also been a query about whether a recording of this seminar it will be available after the session ends and my understanding is that it will and Dirty Street will be releasing it and if, if I'm wrong about that I'll, I'll correct myself at the end. I'd now like to hand over to our third speaker, uh, Keelan Gallagher QC, who, whom for those of you who didn't hear the introduction has led the international team on behalf of the family. Keelan. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Um, thank you, uh, Therese and Jason, for your incredible work. Um, in the time I have available, I just want to concentrate on a few short points. Um, the first thing I just wanted to say is that Daphne's family has long said, and many of you who've been following this case will have seen in our repeated documents on behalf of the family, the family's focus has been that the state authorities in Malta have nothing to fear but the truth. And the central purpose of this inquiry was to uncover that truth. And that important task was entrusted to the Board of Inquiry. And as you've heard so powerfully just now from Paul, uh, from Tony and from Therese, the Board has in its detailed report clearly found that the Maltese state must shoulder responsibility for the assassination, that a culture of impunity was created from the highest echelons of power in Malta, generated from government and its tentacles then spread to other institutions, that the former Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, enabled that culture of impunity, and the report finds that his entire cabinet were collectively responsible for their inaction in the lead up to Daphne's assassination. It details a collapse in the rule of law, as Therese has described. It, it describes a government-sponsored dehumanisation campaign against Daphne, as Paul has so powerfully explained, which prepared the ground for her assassination. And critically, it finds that the state failed to recognize the real and immediate risks to Daphne's life and failed to take reasonable steps to avoid those risks. Now those findings are devastating, but they're not a surprise to the family as Paul has said, or to the legal teams or the civil society organizations supporting the family. They will not be a surprise to Anna Gomez, member of the European Union uh, Parliament, who led an EU mission to Malta a number of years ago to examine the rule of law and progress on preventing money laundering, uh, who said that she agreed entirely with what we and the family have been saying. She said the culture of impunity in Malta fosters corruption, organized financial criminality and state capture. And it was that culture that created the conditions for the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia. So essentially what the report does is it confirms the family's suspicions and fears right from the outset. And what we have been saying for the past almost four years in the multiple published um, legal opinions, which the family have uh, published, and in the submissions that have been made so powerfully in the inquiry by Therese and her team. 
So I just wanted to cover three quick points against that backdrop. Firstly, I wanted to echo a point Tony made earlier about how much of a struggle it's been to secure this report and these findings, because that's an important issue when it comes to lesson learning. Second, I want to give some brief observations on the European and international context before Daphne's death. And thirdly, some brief observations on the European and international context now as we move forward. So on the first point, as Tony has explained at the outset, this inquiry process and the report were a real struggle for the family to achieve. There was resistance to the setting up of the inquiry, despite this being the obvious domestic vehicle through which Malta could comply with its obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 2, the right to life, and Article 10, the right to freedom of expression, alongside the criminal processes. Uh, it only came about under threat of legal proceedings uh, and with very substantial ballast from international organizations, Rebecca Vincent, RSF, the many NGOs who supported us, but also uh, with the support, importantly, of key voices in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, including Peter Omtzis, uh, the Special Rapporteur who was focusing on Malta, and also key voices in the European Parliament, um, like Anna Gomez, who I've just quoted from there. Um, in addition, once the process in fact started in 2019, we then saw repeatedly attempted political interference throughout the process itself. And I'll post in the chat afterwards um, a link to the note which we published in October 2020 on the third anniversary of Daphne's death, raising serious concerns about a political attempt to guillotine the inquiry's processes. So what the Board of Inquiry has produced is in that context. It's in a context where it was a struggle for the board to be set up in the first place, and then it was a struggle for the board to do its job without political interference. So although what we see is a very powerful example of compliance with Article 2 and Article 10, laying bare the failings, examining the question of whether Daphne's death was preventable, examining the question of whether there was state complicity or involvement direct or indirect in the death, uh, that process itself was tainted by those continuing attempts to undermine its independence and to undermine its efficacy. Now, that is against a backdrop of there being very strong international guidance and standards on what Articles 2 and 10 require. And the nature and scope of the duty to protect journalists has received much attention in recent years. It's been the subject of a number of decisions in the European Court of Human Rights, high-level policy statements and commentary at the Council of Europe, the EU, the OSCE, and at UN level. And we've detailed much of that in our um, legal advices, which we can provide to people uh, who are interested. Uh, but despite that backdrop, there was this continued interference. And it's important to bear that in mind when you look at what the Board of Inquiry has managed to produce in the over 400-page document. At the second point I wanted to turn to, relates to the international context prior to Daphne's death. The report focuses on Malta's failures in line with its terms of reference. And Therese has detailed and um, very powerfully just now at what the various strands say. But there are also, frankly, very hard questions to be answered by the international community about why so little was done prior to Daphne's death. The corruption and the culture of impunity laid bare in yesterday's report was known. Daphne reported on it daily on her blog running commentary. The Council of Europe was sufficiently concerned about her safety to conduct an interview with her days before her death about the risks that she faced, uh, the multiple attacks on her home, uh, deaths of her animals, death threats, rape threats, uh, and threats to her family. And despite all of that, nothing was done. And Malta and this culture of impunity was allowed to fester and continue. And it wasn't until the bombing in October 2017 that assassinated Daphne, uh, that in fact the world's attention was drawn to these issues. As a powerful Reuters Investigates report has put it, the assassination ripped open the dark side of Malta, a country in the Mediterranean that's a full member of the European Union, a haven for people dealing in online gambling, offshore finance and cryptocurrencies. And it seems to me that while the report has done a hugely important thing in ensuring that there's reflection within Malta, about Malta's failures, there must also be a process of reflection about why this was allowed to happen under the international community's noses with no action being taken. And the third and final point I wanted to touch on is the international context now post this report. 
More journalists are being assassinated for their work in democracies than ever before. Indeed, the numbers now show that more journalists are assassinated for their work in democracies than in war zones. There is continuing impunity in the vast majority of those cases. 90% of cases involving journalist deaths do not result in a conviction in the criminal courts, let alone a report such as the one we've seen yesterday looking at broader issues of state responsibility and complicity. Even in the European Union and the Council of Europe, which have very clear legal standards in place and where we've had in the Council of Europe the 2016 recommendation of the Committee of Ministers now five years ago, we still are seeing deaths of journalists and we still are seeing a continued culture of impunity. Even this year, we've had two investigative journalists in Europe killed, one in Greece, one in the Netherlands. So it seems to me uh, that if we want uh, the report yesterday to have full impact, not just in Malta, but around the world, it's critical that we look at why the 2016 recommendation of the Committee of Ministers has turned into the paper tiger that the Committee of Ministers precisely did not want it to be. How do we ensure that it has real teeth and that it is implemented in a real practical way so that we do not have a culture of impunity in a European Union Council of Europe member state which continues and festers and is not dealt with? And we do not have other journalists placed in the position that Daphne was. And we do not have a lack of meaningful accountability mechanisms. And um, one of the things which is critical about this case is that Malta is a country which does not have a, a coroner's inquest type process. And as Paul said, it has never before had an inquiry like this conducted in order to comply with Article 2, European, uh, Article 2 of the European Convention with those obligations. Um, but here, we were able to be creative, use the domestic law in order to meet the yardstick set by the European Court of Human Rights. And for all countries in the Council of Europe, it's critical that they now engage in the process of reviewing their laws, reviewing their legal frameworks that the 2016 recommendation called for, and so that we don't have to wait for a horrendous event like this when a journalist dies to see whether our laws are fit for purpose and whether our framework can deliver accountability to a family. We shouldn't have to make this up as we go along and deal with it in an ad hoc way as this family have had to do. We shouldn't have to have a fight in the way that this family have had to do. Every single Council of Europe member state must have a mechanism to ensure that this does not happen again. And if it does happen again, uh, there is a way that the issues can be examined and lessons can be learned. And we can have a report like the one the board delivered yesterday in any case such as this. And that it seems to me is essential um, in terms of learning lessons from this horrendous case and from Paul's loss of his mother. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Keelan. What's been so powerful about the family's achievement is the international coalition which formed to insist upon the truth and to uh, insist upon justice for Daphne and your contribution, Keelan, along with the invaluable contribution from Jonathan Price of Dowdy Street along with Jen Robinson has been essential. Thank you all to all the speakers for staying on time, which means that we have uh, plenty of time at the end after our final speaker to deal with questions and answers. So please do keep those coming in the Q&A facility. Um, speaking of international coalitions, our fourth and final speaker was a, a linchpin in that regard. And she is Rebecca Vincent, Director of International Campaigns at Reporters Without Borders. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Tony. Um... It has been, on for Reporters Without Borders and for me personally, a tremendous privilege and honor to be able to support um, this incredible family in their fight for justice uh, for Daphne. And in fact, uh, to date, it's one of the most successful examples of any campaign I've ever been involved in. One of the reasons that we've really stuck with this is because we believe that Daphne's case is emblematic. Um, firstly in in the manner and the way and the reason she was targeted but now in what we can learn from from how this has been handled what lessons can be drawn um, for other cases for other country contexts going forward um, so of course Daphne was targeted um, you know for her in-depth in investigative reporting on corruption on other really uh, risky topics and in recent years we've seen an increase in, the, in that type of targeting of journalists um, in Europe and other parts of the world we're seeing a shift away from the killings of journalists in situations uh, in countries that are meant to be at war. And now, as of the past couple of years, we're seeing more journalists killed in countries at peace and an alarming number of journalists deliberately targeted um, as Daphne was. 
So that makes it incredibly important um, that we do achieve justice um, for, for Daphne and for the others to send a signal that this will no longer be tolerated, that those who wish to use violence to silence voices such as Daphne's will not get away with it. Um, Keelan alluded to the, the, to the intensive work that went into securing this public inquiry. Um, at the time, it looked impossible. The administration of Joseph Muscat res resisted this at every stage. It took two years of concerted advocacy uh, on, the, on behalf of Daphne's family, on, uh, on the part of her legal team, both in Malta and internationally, international NGOs, and as well as local journalists in Malta and international journalists keeping on this too, reporting it, continuing to shed light on this and holding international bodies and the Maltese government to account. So from that perspective, even securing uh, the establishment of this public inquiry was a significant victory. We are encouraged, in fact, we welcome uh, the publication of this We've called this a landmark report as well. We welcome it. And of course, uh, we will need more time to review the entire 437 pages once the full report is available in English. But our initial assessment is that it is reflective of the independent nature of this, of this uh, public inquiry. We have been encouraged at several stages when the board of, of inquiry has resisted attempts to um, influence its independence and has really uh, moved forward in a way that I think is robust and um, what was needed certainly in Malta. Um, my colleague Pauline, Pauline Adas Mevel testified to the public inquiry last summer on behalf of Reporters Without Borders, um, conveying our view that there were in fact clear warning signs that Daphne faced this sort of risk and it remains our view as well that her assassination could have been prevented. Um, so we are encouraged as well to see uh, that the report does uh, draw similar conclusions to what we've stated. Um, one thing that is important to know is that this is perhaps the end of a certain chapter, but it's only the beginning of much more work that is now needed to be done. Um, some of this will be on the part of the Maltese people to hold their own government to account um, for achieving some of the systemic reforms that are needed. Um, reforms that in fact have been outlined in a number of international reports, some, some of which that Keelan mentioned as well. Um, we have known for several years now, um, in, in terms of the international documentation on this, that there has been a worrying lack of checks on the office of the prime minister in particular, uh, that there has been a deterioration in the broader uh, system of rule of law and democratic institutions in Malta. And so we call again, now that we have another robust report and detailed recommendations here for all of these recommendations to be implemented. And this will be a question of political will. So not just fait accompli and a, an apology for this report, but now we need to see real uh, efforts to, to implement this, to, uh, to go back to the key resolution of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe as well, that in fact put the three month window um, to establish this public inquiry that proved to be uh, really instrumental in actually securing it, noting that every other recommendation in that report has so far not been heeded. Um, so there is no excuse now uh, to, to continue to move forward, um, burying our heads in the sand. And I, I say our, I don't mean our, I mean on the part of the Maltese authority really, um, to, uh, to, to really start to implement this and ensure that this cannot happen to anybody else. One aspect I'd really like to highlight is um, that this inquiry was intended not just to uncover what the state knew about uh, the threats to Daphne and whether they could have prevented her assassination, but also what lessons can be drawn to protect others going forward. So I want to be very clear that it is Reporters Without Borders assessment that journalists in Malta still remain at tremendous risk. Um, Malta dropped 34 places down our World Press Freedom Index in the, in the years since Daphne's assassination. Malta is now ranked 81st out of 180 countries, which is one of the poorest records of any European state. And this is not because of one assassination. This is because of a problematic climate and the risks also faced by many others. Of course, journalists that are pursuing the sort of in-depth uh, investigative reporting that Daphne uh, pursued remain at an elevated risk, but even journalists engaged in, in, in just daily news reporting are so used to a climate of just um, low-level harassment and threats that they perceive as completely normal. But from the outside, it's easy to see that that isn't normal, that that shouldn't be the case, and that there are significant risks still. So it is our hope and one aspect that we will continue to work on to hold the Maltese government to account to ensure that the, the recommendations in this report are implemented to protect others. Journalists should be safe in doing their jobs in Malta and everywhere. 
Um, I will leave it at that for now because I'd love to engage in a, in a discussion. I see some interesting questions coming in. Um, but I should also mention it was not just Reporters Without Borders. We have worked in partnership with a number of international NGOs that, again, this has been one of the most successful examples of coordinated and concerted campaigning that I've ever worked on. Uh, so just to mention a few of the others, I think Article 19, Committee to Protect Journalists, European Center for Press and Media Freedom, the International Press Institute, um, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out a few others, but oh, Penn International, of course, um, we've all worked very closely for nearly four years now, and that support has been really valuable in ensuring uh, the success that we've achieved so far. Um, and maybe just one call to, to any international journalists who are following that. Um, one, one concern I've had at, at times when we've had successes in this case in the past, um, it's always to, to make sure to stick with this, that this is not just something that has now been achieved and that the book is closed and that we all move on. Again, this is just indicative of the work that is needed. Um, so it is important to stick with the ongoing criminal proceedings. And we reiterate our call for every person involved in every aspect of this attack, hitmen, middlemen, masterminds, to be brought to full justice. We need to see criminal justice as well, not, not just the implementation of the recommendations in the public inquiry report. Thank you, Rebecca, and you're quite right to pay tribute to the, the brilliant and broad church that came together and is still together to support the family and, and to support the civil society in, in, in gaining and securing the truth. And of course, in a sense, that work for NGOs and for civil society is just beginning. The inquiry has done its work by identifying the problems, and it's now everyone's responsibility to ensure that report leads to real change. OK, we're doing well for time in that we had hoped to finish this briefing within the hour because we realise everyone's busy and so that leaves lots of time for questions. And the first question I have is for Paul. And it's this. Paul, you've worked so hard with your family over the last four years. What is the most important next step for you? If the government could do one thing to make real change happen, what is it? So for us, the most important thing is that the government, um, as Therese outlined, implements the report's recommendations in full and in a completely non-partisan way and in a way that's also independent from the government itself, which is, again, what Therese said, not what the Prime Minister really proposed this morning in Parliament. I think it would be a great shame if what was a truly independent inquiry in the end um, turns into a, a government-run exercise in cherry-picking reforms. I think the best way of honouring the board's work and my mother is to be open and honest and transparent about these reforms and so that the country can really come together over them and heal. So that is what the family is calling for, the establishment of a panel of experts supported by a select committee in Parliament, non-partisan, cross-party, to make real these reforms. And just as a follow-up question, Therese, I mean, is there a precedent for that in Malta to date? Uh, how likely do, do you feel that call for action is to be realised? Well, there hasn't been a precedent to anything that we've done so far. Um, so we continue to chart a new road, a new route in this regard. However, I strongly believe that this is the best way forward. We simply cannot have uh, uh, the report of a fully independent and impartial uh, public inquiry being now tarnished with partisan, uh, with partisan opinions or with partisan selections. This must be the part that Malta takes on and the state takes on as one unified state. And this is why we need uh, the control of, uh, of such recommendations and the control of the reform to be outside of the hands of the prime minister or of government. This needs to be within the hands of uh, those experts who really um, are independent and truly impartial. Thank you, Therese. And there is a follow up question from Alice Taylor, which, which it poses this. What happens if the report recommendations are not implemented? Is there a legal mechanism that can kick in? What would be the next step? Um, well, 
we are really hoping that the recommendations of this report are implemented in the best way forward, because this is the best interest for this country. But as Keelan was saying before, and also as Rebecca emphasized, this is the best way um, to proceed even outside our jurisdiction. We really need to have a good look at how we are protecting journalists and how we are disrespecting journalism and how we are really pushing aside um, the interests that uh, um, our democracy demands of those journalists. However, if the recommendations are not implemented, then yes, there could be the possibility of other further action. And that's in domestic law. Keelan, I mean, did you want to outline briefly whether there would be international remedies if domestic law remedies failed? Yes, so we obviously have that very much in mind. I mean, Malta is a um, member state of the Council of Europe. Uh, ultimately, we have the option of going to the European Court of Human Rights um, if accountability mechanisms fail within Malta. But what Paul has said, um, and all of the family have said right from the outset, uh, since we first met um, within days of the assassination, has been that actually getting a judgment from Strasbourg after the investigative trail has gone cold is not, has not been this family's focus. They've wanted ideally to avoid having to do that, and they want to ensure that things um, are done right sooner. And one of the things for the lawyers who are on this call that I think is particularly interesting is the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe played a really key role here. And we're used as lawyers to thinking of enforcement of Council of Europe standards coming through the judicial processes, going to the European Court of Human Rights in a process which often takes six or seven years. But actually here, the role played by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was really critical because actually this inquiry would not have happened were it not for um, the support that we got from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe at uh, the three month deadline that was set by the Parliamentary Assembly for Malta to comply with its obligations, and then the 11th hour uh, reluctant agreement to, uh, in fact, institute this inquiry. So I think as well as thinking of judicial mechanisms and the potential for going to the European Court of Human Rights, we may need to call on our uh, friends who were uh, of great assistance in enforcing those international standards previously too. Thank you, Keelan. Rebecca, is there anything you'd like to add on that question? I have other ones for you later, if not. Um, no, I think Keelan hit the nail on the head, and I, I think that was an unusually strong resolution from PACE setting that specific time, time window and could possibly also be used as an example for PACE in the future because it proved to be quite effective. Thank you. There are some technical questions which I'm going to come to at the end, but I would like to put some more questions to Paul, uh, and I'm going to roll some up. There's, uh, there's one from Jessica Arena and another from Nicole Mylak, and they are, Paul, will the family be meeting with the Prime Minister? Do you accept his apology? And the third strand is local activist groups are calling for the resignation of cabinet members who were singled out in the inquiry report for shortcomings or wrongdoings in the run up to Daphne's assassination. Does the family share in this call um, and, 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 and any other views on that? Sure, so thank you for the questions. Um, we have no plans to meet the prime minister. Um, we would if he offered a meeting. The apology, as I said at the start, um, it's something we accept. Uh, so he made an apology in Parliament this morning. And we totally agree that that apology is owed to the entire country, um, which was put through incredible trauma. Um, and so, the apology, again, is owed to all of Malta and not just us. On people singled out in the report, of course, we think there should be complete accountability for every failing, for every single failing by whoever it is. And we know that there are still people to face any sort of accountability for their actions. And we, we won't be letting go of, of this. Thank you, Paul. And there was a similar question from Kevin Shemery Orland. I hope you feel that's answered it, Kevin. OK, I have some more technical questions, which I um, will throw up into the panel, and you should feel free to answer them, whoever, whoever has a view on it. Um, the first is from Frayne Marovic from the International Jurisdiction Policy Network, who I think has had to leave. So it would be good if we could get her or him this answer um, later on. And it says, congratulations to all of you on this great achievement, incredible work. 
Um, my question is if the report addresses the numerous slaps lawsuits that were launched against Daphne and are still faced by the family. Who would like to deal with that? Um, I'll say something quick on that, Tony. Um, the report does deal with that question about slap lawsuits. So there are strategic lawsuits against public participation. So basically the use of um, libel to try to chill and silence um, journalistic work. Uh, so the report finds that while there's nothing wrong with private actors, of course, using libel litigation to protect their uh, rights, the use of libel by state entities um, or state persons should be used only very exceptionally and in cases where the injury is very serious. Uh, the board does acknowledge the reform of media and defamation laws in Malta in 2018, including the abolition of criminal libel, and it deals expressly with um, the Henley story in there. Uh, so you can see that in the courtesy translation. I just wanted to say a very quick thing on slaps, which links to a point I made earlier, um, because the truth uh, for me is that this happened under our noses because we let it. And when you look at many of those slap lawsuits, many of them emanated from law firms in London. Um, so this isn't a Maltese issue only. So there were respected international law firms who operate in London um, who were threatening Daphne and she faced uh, tens of criminal and civil libel suits at the time of her death, attempts to silence her. And that issue of slaps is really key. I know Rebecca wants to say something on that too. And while the report does deal with it, there's a much broader Europe-wide issue about slaps. And there's currently a working group within the European Parliament uh, looking at that, it, within the European uh, Union, looking at that issue. And Matthew Caruana Galizia is involved in that, uh, which is very important. But reform is needed because at the moment, libel law is being used in a way which chills free speech, chills the kind of work which uh, Daphne was engaged in. And in fact, one of Daphne's last blogs in the months leading up to her death was about the misuse of libel laws and libel laws being used to try to silence the kind of vital work which she was doing. And there were people like Daphne who will continue to do their work, continue to report despite those threats. I'm afraid there are many uh, who will stop reporting and who will be chilled and will be stunned into silence by those kind of threats by people with deep pockets and lack of scruples. Thank you, Keelan. Rebecca. Um, I think it is worth highlighting here that uh, former Prime Minister Joseph Muscat to this day continues to pursue a posthumous libel suit against Daphne, as well as one against her son, Matthew. Um, now, of course, he's no longer Prime Minister, but those suits were initiated when he was. Um, and they continue to this day. A few others as well. I believe still the um, the, the suit brought by former minister, uh, Conrad Mitzi. So these suits, in our view, should be dropped. and. Um, other similar suits that continue against journalists in Malta as well. Malta will also serve as an interesting case study going forward, um, in part due to Daphne's assassination and the aftermath and how Maltese media responded in the aftermath. We now know more internationally about how such suits are used to silence independent media. And as an international community, we've already been able to, to, to integrate that into our work and, and to work more effectively on SLAP abroad. So it's been incredibly important that um, uh, courageous voices in Malta have spoken out on this, um, continue to do so. And I was encouraged by an example last year of a number of media in Malta working together to fight back against um, uh, one such suit, which was uh, enabled by a law firm in London as well. Theresa, thank you, Rebecca. Theresa or Jason, did you want to add anything to in relation to that question? Yes, please. I think there are two points I would like to raise in this regard. Um, during the evidence collected before the Board of Inquiry, we actually heard evidence that members of government, ministers, the Prime Minister himself, was involved in, ex in an exchange of emails where one of uh, the companies entrusted with implementing the citizenship uh, um, uh, policy for Malta, the citizenship program for Malta, was actually seeking the government's approval to issue and to institute slap proceedings against Maltese journalists, including Daphne. And I think this is what makes uh, this particular case of Daphne so horrendous, because even there in the institution of slap proceedings, you see the involvement of members of government. However, the institution of slap proceedings is something which needs to go beyond the involvement or rather there, it is wrong even where there is no involvement from government officials. It is wrong, however, for government officials to continue to expect and to wait 
for the European Union to come up with its own regional legislation, with its own directive in this regard, without themselves also taking all those measures that are necessary to protect journalists from now. Because we've been faced with a situation in this country where um, uh, draft legislation, private members' bills were presented to this parliament, and yet the government has continuously found the excuse that on, this can only be done, this protection can only be given if the EU moves on jointly together on a directive. But when I've put that question to Commissioner Reindeer in one of our meetings, um, he did not agree with that. He simply said that member states should go ahead and provide that protection. And I am sure that there is, there are possibilities, legal possibilities of providing that protection. I think when we speak of slap proceedings against journalists, we also need to see um, how much the courts value journalists, how much the courts value the concept of um, the chilling effect that these proceedings have on journalists. And in this particular case, we were speaking of Daphne as an individual. Daphne did not have a whole infrastructure behind her to protect her from suits which were presented against her by several members of government, from suits which were presented against her abusively, I would say, simply to put an end to her financial independence. Um, and uh, even if you look at other, the position of other media houses, these proceedings, even one of these proceedings, could simply bring them to nothing. The effects, the, the, the financial implications for media houses is simply too cruel and would simply have a devastating chilling effect on that media institution, whoever it is. Thank you very much, Therese. Paul, did you have anything to add on that? Uh, no, thank you, Tony. That thank covers you. it. We have two minutes left. I'm afraid there was a number of questions I didn't get in. I'm sorry about that to those who asked them. But if I ask them now, we're not going to have a proper opportunity to respond. So thank you very much for pushing them. And I apologize that we didn't get to them. In, in, the, in the couple of minutes left, what I'd like to do is, is to thank first and foremost Paul and his family for their courage and bravery in, in, in coming this far in their journey. We know it's not the end in some senses. It's the beginning, but it's now time for the rest of us in civil society in Malta and in the international community to take up the baton and to use this very powerful report to affect real change. And it's certainly in this jurisdiction. It's the 20 year anniversary of the McPherson report and we see the Home Affairs Joint Select Committee today. Um, drawing attention to the real problems in implementing that report and the fact that although it has made some reforms, there's still so much change to happen. And that's precisely what we do not wish to happen in relation to this report into Daphne's death and into journalistic freedom more generally. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, all of the Corona Galizia family. And thank you to all our speakers and panelists and all of those who supported the family in their journey so far and to Data Street for hosting this event. Thank you very much. And all the information like the, the English translation of the report informally done to date, et cetera, will be, is either on the chat or will be released after this event. Thank you all and goodbye.